wondered if a person can recover after a tragic event. Can we heal or are we forever damaged or changed? And what about after numerous traumas? Is healing possible? And what, if anything, can we do to help, whether it's to help others or to help ourselves? If you've asked yourself these questions, you're not alone. As a licensed psychologist for over 30 years, I've worked primarily with victims of trauma. This refers to those who have suffered the devastating effects of abuse, assaults, accidents, addictions, death, divorce, illness, injury, neglect, natural disasters, substance abuse, violence, and more. For the last 15 years, I've had the privilege of helping victims of human trafficking and sexual exploitation. I've learned that most every one of us has or will experience one or more traumas in our lifetime. Research on trauma confirms its prevalence. One in four U.S. children experience some form of maltreatment, and over one in three girls and one in seven boys experience sexual abuse as a minor, according to studies by Russell Finkelhor and others. And over one in three women and one in four men are victims of rape, physical violence, and or stalking by an intimate partner reported in a study by Black and Associates. 40 to 50% of marriages end in divorce and natural disasters affect thousands upon thousands of people every year. The Comprehensive Study on Adverse Childhood Experiences or ACEs reported that one in six people experienced four or more. And many of the amazing survivors of abuse and prostitution I know have shared of having suffered five or more of these childhood traumas. Given the odds, everyone will experience at least one, but more likely multiple traumas in their lifetime. Overwhelming trauma experiences leave victims feeling confused and emotionally unsteady. What helps survivors heal after horrendous life events? People. We need people to help steady us. And as I've traveled around the world and trained on trauma recovery, I shared the following belief. Everyone can be part of the healing process. You don't have to be a professional counselor. Everyone can help. But to help, we need to understand trauma with our head and with our heart. We want to be what I call trauma sensitive, not just trauma informed. We, we need to learn about what trauma is, how it affects people, and what are the common symptoms and thoughts, feelings, and behaviors. We call this psychoeducation. But as we gain this head knowledge, our heart increases its capacity to show genuine empathy. And when victims learn about common trauma responses and reactions, it's like a burden is lifted and they experience normalization and validation. Or as I like to say, they realize they're not alone and they're not crazy. With this trauma-sensitive perspective, we can help others more effectively and help ourselves heal more quickly. Well, to help us become more trauma-sensitive, let me share the trauma dance. I developed this to demonstrate the life of an individual who's experienced multiple traumas. It's an external expression of an internal reality. So it all begins with the life of Anna. Now, while I use a female in this example, the victim could be anyone. She will demonstrate the life of a child beginning around age seven. Life is good and she feels safe, secure, and happy. Life. Life. She has just experienced a trauma. It could be any of a number of horrific life events, such as family violence or sexual abuse. Her ability to cope is surpassed by this overwhelming, unwanted experience. She doesn't know what to think, what to feel, or what to do. She's overcome with a variety of emotions. She may feel 
angry, betrayed, confused, fearful, grief-stricken, or guilty, all common to those who suffered a trauma. Well, slowly the destabilizing effects decrease and she begins to heal, perhaps weeks, months, or years later, depending on whether or not she tells anyone what happened and depending on whether or not she has supportive, caring people in her life. Well, finally she becomes stable, but she adapts. She's no longer carefree. Life, life, another trauma, perhaps a serious accident or her parents' divorce or the death of a family member. Once again, her ability to cope is surpassed by this overwhelming experience. And like before, she doesn't know what to think, what to feel and what to do. She's confused and uncertain. Again, this may go on for weeks, months or years later, depending on her disclosure and her support system, but also depending on how she internalizes the experience. Because unfortunately, many victims of trauma develop unhealthy negative thoughts and beliefs, which generally focus on self-blame. Eventually, she begins to stabilize and she adapts once again. She's now more cautious. Life, life, another trauma. She's now a teenager and perhaps it's a friend's suicide or another incident of sexual abuse. What is she feeling? Probably fear and anxiety, along with the usual guilt and shame. What might she be thinking or telling herself? Perhaps such statements as, I should have known better. I'm so stupid. I can't trust anyone. It's my fault. And what about school? How might she be doing? If she was doing well before, now she's preoccupied with other concerns. Her schoolwork, activities, and friendships all suffer. Many victims of multiple interpersonal trauma begin to believe that they deserve what is happening. They incorporate harmful coping skills and behaviors. These can include eating disorders, lying, stealing, perfectionism, promiscuity, self-harm, substance abuse, rebellion, vandalism, and more. They're trying to lessen or deaden that emotional pain. Various research studies by Courtois, Andrew Kolk, and others have found that once a person has been a victim of interpersonal trauma, such as sexual abuse, they're more likely to be re-victimized. Anna's life now feels out of control and she longs for that happiness, safety, and security she felt before. These horrible events have changed her view of people and safety and trust. She feels helpless and hopeless, self-hatred and self-blame. Now she fully embraces this protective, fearful stance. She's hyper-vigilant alert to everything around her in an effort to foresee and possibly prevent the next terror. Life, life, another trauma. She's now a young adult and perhaps it's a rape or a physical assault. And before she can regain her footing again, another trauma. Perhaps it's the death of a parent or a controlling relationship. And as the world spins around her, she responds in one of two ways. She either becomes that hypervigilant in a feeble attempt to fend off additional hurt and harm, and also to keep people at a distance, or she's overcome with helplessness and apathy, feeling that there's nothing she can do and no one that can help. She's now in this continual state of instability. She's unable to recover on her own. This is now her life. 
Can you remember back to when she was happy and smiling? Now her life is full of this internal conflict and chaos. Remember the trauma dance is an external expression of an internal reality. This multiplicity of traumas leads to this instability, which leads to an inability to overcome. Victims need help in order to regain that sense of safety and security. So what can we do to help, whether it's to help others or ourselves? Let's return to the trauma dance. So as Anna continues to struggle, a caring person comes to attempt to stabilize her. Hopefully Anna will allow her to help. But what happens? How is our helper doing? Instead of stabilizing Anna, the helper has now become unstable. This illustrates what we call vicarious trauma. That's the trauma experienced by those who work with the traumatized. When we hear story after story of grief, sadness, sorrow, and suffering, we can begin to experience it ourselves. So what if more people come alongside? They're determined to help alleviate Anna's chaos, each firmly holding on. Does it work? The struggle continues. But instead of grabbing and trying to help her individually, what if they work together? How are they doing? Anna now feels more safe, stable, and secure. She can focus on life and not just on surviving. When the helpers work together in unity, they're able to support Anna more safely and effectively. See, as helpers, we need to work with others to share the load and to guard against vicarious trauma. And as victims, we need to allow others to help. We need to surround ourselves with as many caring, supportive people as possible, whether it's friend or family, coworker or counselor, professional, pastor, priest, or neighbor. With safe people, healing becomes possible and possibilities become reality. So what do you do if you don't have a team? Well, let's look at one more scenario. We return to Anna when she's overwhelmed. This time, however, a caring person comes just to be present. She knows that she can't stabilize Anna physically and emotionally on her own. She listens. She provides non-judgmental and unconditional encouragement. Anna slowly begins to open up. See, research confirms that emotional healing increases with the presence of a supportive, caring person in the victim's life. Sometimes the emotionally wounded just needs someone to be there, not to fix anything or to do or to say anything. Their presence gives us the space we need to heal. I've never regretted helping someone in need, whether by myself or with others. And I've never forgotten the kindness of others during dark, difficult times in my own life. To answer our, our original questions, is healing possible? Yes. I've had the privilege to witness emotional healing in the lives of those who've been coerced and controlled, beaten and battered, used, abused, and sold. How I wish I could share of those who've recovered and even flourished after traumas. And the studies on human resilience abound, inspiring us with stories of wounded people who've overcome overwhelming circumstances. The survivors, the overcomers, the thrivers. Can you help? Yes. You've gained head knowledge about trauma and how it affects people, 
and you've hopefully gained more heart empathy. You are becoming trauma sensitive. You can help others more effectively and help yourself more readily. For the despairing and downtrodden, you can help ignite hope.